Thank you for having me and um, coming here on a Sunday night at 8 o'clock. I know it's a bit, it might be boring to listen to me at this hour, but um, I hope um, you get to find a bit of yourself at the end of the speech. First of all, I have to tell um, that I'm utterly proud and happy to be asked to come here as a speaker after 22 years. Um, I believe that this was once the place that changed my whole life and the place that gave me the perception to look from another angle. Um, I walked into this door at the age of 15, now I'm 41, um, when I was a freshman year and um, when I graduated here after four years, in my senior year, there was a different Nazi out there, probably more confident and ready for the tough world. I will briefly try to tell you how my life had um, shaped up so that maybe it will give you little hints in your future life, as I have said. My interest in television popped up in my last two years at Tassis. Media was pretty popular back then, and my curious personality and eagerness to search for the truth drew me uh, more into the business and in 1999, I started out as a correspondent on field and then became an editor and then manager when I um, finally ended up as an editor-in-chief and an anchor for a primetime news at the one of the four most valued national TV stations in Turkey, which is called Star TV. It's one of the four um, main and mostly watched television stations, I would say. But um, success on TV definitely is very much dependent on teamwork as in everything else. And uh, I have to give credit to my 43 other colleagues of mine that have been working with me throughout the years. Um, and I have also another need to thank another alumni that used to go to Tassis, who is Mr. Ferit Shahenk, who have made the stream possible by establishing such a well-trusted and leading news and entertainment channel in Turkey and my family, who let pursue my dreams come true. Um, Turkey is a country of colors. It's boiling news from all over. In the morning, we wake up with the visit of Putin. In the afternoon, problems with Syria, and here, the death of Jemal Khashoggi, as you may have heard at night. By the end of the evening, it's like local and inter international news passing by. It's a happening country, but it's also happening in light life. So the stories that I might tell you throughout in the last 15, 20 minutes might be a little uh, fast frustrating, but um, Turkey is also a very, um, let's say, colorful country. So, and also he said it has a, uh, if you ever come to, Turkey, please be my guest because it has also very wild life as well. I love politics and uh, subjects that shape the future of my country interest me. For example, we're preparing once again for a referendum to be voted. On the other hand, um, as we have been fighting with terror over the years, over the past probably 30, 40 years now, regrettably the first stories in our news bullets are still um, of Marty's nowadays. Turkey has a very strategic location and importance of foreign relations, the war in Syria, the refugee problem, and many other headlines affects and interests Turkey deeply. Contrary to other countries, it has always been a challenge to keep up with the headlines in Turkey as well. And if we were to go back in time, before that I'll just um, show you maybe a footage so that you understand exactly what I do. This is a part of it, so it will play in the background while I'm talking. Um, so basically, I anchor the news at every during every weekday, and I'm also the chief of editor. And this is the footage of the prime time news back in Turkey. If we were to go back in time and start from the beginning, I was definitely a sentimental, highly emotional, and a bit timid and introverted girl. My mother keeps saying that um, I cried for three days. Whether I saw an ambulance passing by as I wondered whether the person in the ambulance made it to the hospital and whether he was okay or not. I cried for days, she would say. I do not remember my grades being any higher than 1.25, 1.50, as uh, thinking the highest grade is 10 back in elementary school. And yet, you know, they say the hair, even the um, skin of human being change every seven years and shed its skin. So in my case, when I believe that when I hit the age of 15 and came here as a student to Tassos, 
uh, for four years, I think my personality and my character shed its skin as well. I look a little different, yeah, I can tell. I was a young girl, protected by her mother and father. It was important that I had a solid upbringing in terms of ethics, values, as well as empathy as well. Because empathy is putting yourself in the shoes of someone else. Uh, in between, I developed empathy to different nations and the people at Tassis. Truly, Tassis is the first color of my life, I would definitely say. It added vision, it added teamwork, it added um, grounded values. Your values are the pillars of construction, and my pillars were established here at Tassis. That's why it's very important to be here, because if I'm one of the strongest persons in the media business back in my country, it's not because of the smarts or the hard work or the success. I believe it's all about having values. And guess what? Life never puts you down if you have and keep your values. You have to have priorities in life and my country is my priority. Your values and priorities are in line with your work. If someone came to school talking about, right now, like, like me, talking about values and ethics, and I would probably say blah, 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 but guess what? You will choose a friend, your friends, even your boyfriend and girlfriend later on in the future based on their values. And uh, after I was done at Tassis and I went to Emerson in Boston, I remember my, I remember my favorite class was the public speaking class and uh, it was like a huge salon full of people and the teacher once told me, it's like, okay, you're gonna walk in there and you're gonna talk in front of everyone. And I said, okay, then I opened the door, I went in, in the middle of the salon I looked around, I said, no, I cannot do this. And I ran back out. <laughs> and then um, I had to practice for it. And later on, uh, after studying, working hard, after a month, I came back and uh, eventually passed the grades. I left for college. I completed my BA with honors degree in three years of time in a very hasty manner. I studied, I minored in psychology and then majored in TV production as if I predicted the future. I graduated and came back to work. It does not mean that I probably love the school years. I wouldn't say that because the following years of my professional life and has always been my reality and in fact my way of life. When I was a kid, I remember my mom taking me to Taksim Square. It's one of the proudest places in Turkey. Um, and then as we were walking hand to hand, when a passing bay homeless spat in my face and my mother was so worried, we had to run back home and she washed me rubbing over my skin for five days. It was the last time I saw Taksim Square till I began serving as a correspondent on NTV, which is the, one of the leading news channels in Turkey back in 1999. In 1999, I came for an internship to NTV, one of the leading news channels owned by Ferit Cenk as well back then. I got into the building and I asked myself, I said, what department do I really want to work? And uh, I was clueless. I knew that I wanted to work in the media business, but I didn't know what to do. Um, so I came into the company, the television company. I got into the building. Um, there was this culture and arts department, it was all about arts and artwork and lessons and exhibitions and many concerts. I said, no, this is definitely not for me. And uh, though I have to say that my photography classes with Mr. Doshman at Tassis has always been uh, my, one of my favorites. Then I headed for the economy department, I've never been good with numbers. And there was this whole price index, consumer price index, press meetings along with the, you know, with the breakfast and I didn't enjoy it much, so I moved on to the sports department. I'm trying to figure out what I really, really like. And there were the soccer games and the scores and I decided it wasn't for me. Last but, lastly, uh, last but uh, not least, I entered the newsroom and I found myself in the department of intelligence. I believe six years I spent in the field of NTV, uh, fed that excited, the curious, the investigative, and the researcher, adrenaline seeker part of me. It was at that time that there were protests against this typical kind of prisons in Bayram Pasha. I got a phone call in the middle of the night, I remember. It was like I was on a secret mis mission. Uh, I remember tiptoeing as I left the house and there were clashes and explosions around and I came back home after two days working as a correspondent. In a nutshell, I wanted to touch upon the lies which we read in the books and 
uh, watched in the movies. This is why you need to be in the right in the middle of what you exactly do and what you will be doing in your future life. Being a correspondent lies right in the heart of the profession, in the center of the kitchen, and you need to put some salt into the meal and maybe even roast it. Because you cannot share the story unless you experience it. And it will not be realistic though you share it. This is why though I'm the chief editor today, I've always kept my stance as a correspondent. And let alone the clashes and interrogations, um, I tested my emotionality on probably more than 200 dead bodies that I saw, um, which were at a probably arm's length to me. Then I got engaged, this is years back, and there was this businessman called Uzey Gari, uh, this very important businessman in Turkey, and also a family friend of my pa parents as well. He joined our engagement ceremony. I was sitting in the newsroom the following week, and there came an announcement on the police radio. And back then we would listen to the police radio, um, and I still know the codes by heart. On the radio it said, he was killed in the middle of the cemetery. I asked myself, to whether I heard that was true. So I ran to the cemetery, to the scene of crime, and saw that it was him indeed. He was on the floor, drenched in blood. I got extremely sad. I remember crying for hours. I followed up the entire case. The murder was caught and came to the courthouse. I joined all those cases and the murder said, I just wounded him. And when I got down, I heard him sh shouting out for help. I went back and killed him. I asked myself whether what he said was the truth. I was skeptical, you know. I went to the cemetery again, put a sand glass at the bottom of the stairs, and then I climbed up and down the stairs trying to find out whether he could have killed himself in such a short period of time. In brief, I have had many similar experiences. Um, I remember after my graduation from Emerson College, um, the American Department of State holds one of one and a half months along the International Visitor Leadership Program and uh, it chooses the people having the capacity to, be, to become leaders in their own ca uh, countries and fields. A program covering visits to Pentagon and to the White House and Margaret Thatcher was once in it. Our former President Suleiman Demirel was also once in it. And um, they called me, they said, would you want to come? I said, of course, uh, I would be delighted. And then I was there, and I was the only Turk who was invited to the program that year. And uh, years after, back in my country, they blamed me of being an agent just because I joined the program. <laughs> in my professional life of 20 years now, um, I have been given quite of a lot of titles. I was called a partisan just because I wear the flag of my country in my necklace. You know, the Americans wear these t-shirts and shorts and um, just because I wear a necklace with the star and the crescent of the Turkish flag on it, they call me racist, fascist, everything. I guess that uh, when you're a woman, you're an easy prey. And it is true that it's not easy to be to a woman in the media business in Turkey, as we're all working and struggling in a male-dominated media. To cite an example, it was the Workers' Day, I never forget. Uh, we went out to make it the, the news with our colleagues, and we took a picture to remember the day on the you know, famous bridge of, uh, it's called Parpa. I looked at the picture, there were only two females, me, the 22-year-old me, and another female colleague of mine, just two of us, and the rest, they were all men. And it was a couple of months back, I believe, our Prime Minister, again, invited the Chief of Editors, of the media outlets and newspapers to the palace, so we went there all together. I was not lazy, I counted, there were 43 people sitting in the, at the table, uh, the chief of editors, and uh, only two of them were female, and one of them was me. Um, I guess in the male-dominated media, we exerted our efforts to so much that I went for positive discrimination against women in my own newsroom, I manage on a subconscious level probably. This is why the Istanbul news editor and the, the capital, Ankara news editor, the domestic news editor and the world news editor are all women. I do not uh, want to disparage males, however I trust in the eyes and hearts of the women. Our profession is about hearts and we love performing our profession and we work passionately. Otherwise, what you do will not bring out any good. 
Um, we're not mechanical, of course. We get harmed, for sure, mostly around the magical screen, for sure. When one is exposed to too many traumatic events, the number of breaking points rise up. I'll try to tell you why I mentioned this. Mehmet is a very common name for the soldiers in Turkey, and there are no soldiers or no policemen in my family, but I seriously love the soldiers and policemen of my country uh, because they have been fighting with terror over 30 years now. Yes, I'm known as a patriot, a fan of Ataturk, our great leader who had brought democracy to my country, and I think my greatest luck lies beneath uh, growing up and raised up in my land. Yet again, I have always felt that the soldiers and the policemen of my country were very lonely. They're not heeded sufficiently. And I decided to become their war. So I decided to be by their side on a special day, since it might be important to them. So I decided to spend the New Year's Eve with them. I thought of where I should go. I checked out the furthest point in the map. On the border lines, Dalaj, it's right by northern Iraq and Turkey. It's on the very east side of Turkey. Even probably most of the Turkish people do not know about it. Uh, it's between northern Iraq and Turkey, as I said. It's called Dalija, where 16 soldiers in Turkey fell Marty in 2015. Probably you would not, or the, even the Turkish people would not be able to locate it on a map. Uh, maybe they only heard it in the news. So I got on two helicopters and one airplane and went there. I would spend some time with them. I could not go on the New Year's Eve due to security reasons and weather conditions, so I got permission for two weeks later, and I got a shooting permit for only 24 hours, and that was my time started. I'll just briefly um, show you a part of that as well. This is how it looks like. So this is exactly where I was, to give you an idea. We climbed up the Beybuta Hill, that's the mountain in other words, um, with an altitude of 2,753 meters. It's basically in the middle of nowhere. You know, you should have a life purpose to serve there. You should love your country, you should love the flag, and you should have definitely a big heart, uh, because you cannot get anything in the monetary equivalent. People sacrifice their lives there. So I went there, uh, they basically sleep in a place like a cave. The weather conditions are so bad, uh, that it is about minus 20 degrees, freezing cold, and even, even talking to a person is really difficult. Snow reaches about two meters. So once upon a time, the helicopter comes in, drops the lunch boxes, and the soldiers eat some of it. They sleep in such places for my country. And uh, once the shooting was over, we climbed up the mountain. I spent the night with 1,500 soldiers back there. Shooting was over, so we sat, we chatted and we would go to bed, yet it would be very impossible for me to sleep. I came to my room and somebody came and knocked on my door. There was a young surgeon in his 20s. And he said, Sister Nazi, could you please come and spend some time with us, maybe drink tea with us? And I said, sure, I will. And I talked to them and they shared their stories. Some of them would be discharged soon and some were counting back the days. As they shared their stories, I couldn't help looking at the television because there was a little music channel and you know, um, there was this closed caption, you know, with how the lovers send their messages to each other. When the shooting was over, by the way, my mother's a bit worried, obviously, because I'm going into these war places. I never tell her where I go. I said, Mom, I'm going to the capital of uh, Turkey because I need to um, interview a politician. She said, on a Sunday, I said, yeah, yeah, no worries, because I had 24 hours shooting time, and uh, the, we landed in Bankfleet, a couple of hours later the airplane would take off, and we would, like, uh, we would make our last preparations. We sat down to wait for the flight, in the meantime, my mom calls me from FaceTime, so I'm sitting in, in between the commanders, my mom is calling, she's like, um, ah, I just purchased these earrings, can you see? I said, mom, I'll, I'll call you later, I'm not in Ankara right now, I'm not in the capital right now, and she said, where are you? I said, I lied to you, I'm not in Ankara. She said, where are you? I said, I'm down in Dalaj. She said, where is that? Of course, she doesn't know as well. I said, it's in the east part of Turkey, close to Van, Hakkari, Yüksek, or whatever. And the shooting is over, I'm on my way back home. She said, I'm gonna kill you when you get here. <laughs> and, then, um, and then she said, no, you're not telling me the truth. I bet you're in Ankara, you're just making fun of me. I said, no. And then, you know, with the FaceTime, I just 
switch the phone to the other side, and there were seven commanders sitting right there. And she says, I pay your respects, please take care of my daughter, will you? <laughs> we actually say that we would not get used to the news related to the soldiers falling Marty, and they're the people who are in real danger. Again, I went to another part, uh, which is called Lusaibin, and there was this curfew in place, and the clashes were ongoing, and we would make the shooting, and um, they would perform an operation. We were seated at around the table, and we were talking about as how they should work and how time, how much time they have left in the field and what extent they clean the region from the terrorist organizations. We had our tea. We left for the shooting and they left for their work, for the operations. Uh, a couple of hours passed by and we came back and sat down again and looked at where Ali was seated because in the morning he was sitting right beside me. So I said, where is Ali? And Ali was not there. And one of his friends said, he felt Marty in the building full of explosions, improvised explosive device, two hours ago. I said, how come Ali found Marty? Probably the news come into our lives in a span of 60 seconds with uh, the news of Marty's and there's a crying mother, wife, orphan left behind and there's a crying mother and uh, we say it's over for us, yet life is left half finished for them because an amber burns where it falls. Their lives will always be half finished. One day we were back at home from Dalija, from this place where we did the shooting. We got on a military helicopter. Those helicopters take off very rarely, you know, especially in those places. So there's one group of soldiers, they would uh, take a leave for the shopping. And uh, we got on the helicopter and we were packed like sardines inside. On the way, two Cobra helicopter pilots were seated next to me and they said, could you please take a picture? Um, I said, sure. And then he said, but please make a selfie with your own hand. I said, okay. And I took the picture and 22 la days later, uh, Burak, the guy who actually asked me to take the picture, fell Marty as well. We will always gather pain and one always pays the price. I've been put on various trials, including the, wise, uh, the ones related with ISIS and with PKK terrorist organizations. And I still stand trials today. I've been faced with death threats, parliamentary investigations, insults, threats. And to give an example, the police handed out a list of suicide bombers since a couple of people were taught uh, to become suicide bombers. And they asked me, could you make it to the news? I said, sure. And we covered it. And two days later, I got a call from the security. They said, you have a notification. And I thought another case was opened against me. I checked it out. And so one of the girls we covered in our news on suicide bombers, he said, how come you can call me a suicide bomber? I'm a university student. I'm not a bomber, she said. Um, so I bore testimonies eventually. I went back and forth to the courthouse. Some time passed by and two days later, no, not two years later, a clash in front of the police station in Istanbul and one police fell Marty and there were two women lying dead on the floor and there were bombs connected to this woman uh, and with the, these, these big guns, Kalashnikovs in their hands and they were the dead terrorists and it was one of the girls who actually opened the case against me two years prior to the event. Um, I was automatically acquitted. Um, did the payback actually outstrip the dis disadvantages? I never knew the answer. However, I wanted to make a difference and wanted to wake up with the sleepers in the established order. And uh, I did it all with love and passion. Cases and investigations and life threats. As you might imagine, my mother says, um, enough of it, quit the job. Are you going to save the world, she says. No, the power I hold would not be sufficient to save the world. Yet I thought I could have the power to change things a bit from the armchair that I'm seated in. I've always believed that a different Turkey would emerge if we all swept in front of our door. Always, maybe, I don't know, own big fields and big buildings that will be, uh, that I will be leaving to my daughter later on. Now she's 10 years old. But at least she will have a mother who has tried to change the things. The roads at some, at some point, but it will end for all of us, obviously. But um, what's important is how many lives that you have touched upon. Technology, artificial, uh, artificial intelligence will keep on, but values will never change. This means that you know what is right and wrong for you. 
and uh, you do not care about what the other says. In my job, for example, one day I'm together with the president of the country, the other day with the, another important leader or a businessman or a mayor. I started looking about people, not like identities. So don't make a big deal out of people. After all, we're all humans and we all go and pee. <laughs> so try to make fun with your life and enjoy every minute and don't let somebody be a priority when you're all to, to them is an option it is our choice of how we use our time life and time are the best two teachers i believe and uh, life teaches us to make good use of time and time teaches us the value of time as william shakespeare said um, time is very slow those who want very fast for those who are scared very long for those who are sad and very short for those who celebrate, but for those who love, time is eternal. And um, as you're sitting in your chairs and listening to what we're saying, I want you to keep in mind that you're extremely <coughs> lucky to be a part of the coolest high school ever, mm -hmm. uh, which you will real realize probably as you move on in life. The friends you make here from all around the world will always come across your life and uh, that day will be the most special ones. Um, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, I got a phone call uh, from a friend of my dad, and uh, he said, tell you what, someone is looking for you. I said, who? This girl from Denmark, uh, whom I know uh, from you know, business relationships. I said, who is she? He said, it's Marie Tegesen. Oh my God, I said, 22 years ago, I met her at Tacit's. She used to be my, one of my best friends. And for some reason, I couldn't find her on social media. So we met after 22 years. And I just realized that nothing has changed. It's just uh, the friendships that you make at Tacit's, they're very special. Uh, and uh, they will come across as you move on in life.